Welcome to Evil Live, the live media commentary show that answers the question, is my spoon long enough to sup with the devil? Subscribe if you're new to the channel, because today we are reviewing Duncan Birmingham's <laughs> Who Invited Them. It's a film. All right. So, uh, initial thoughts. This was a fun ride, though flawed. In the end, there was infinitely more good than there ever could have been bad. So this is directed by and written by Duncan Birmingham. It was released September 1st, 2022. I personally saw it on Shudder, though I see it is available on nearly every streaming platform. So wherever you are, you should be able to see this film. And I do highly recommend that you do watch it because again, while it's not groundbreaking and amazing, there is a nice little twist that you can see coming at the very end that is just, I don't know, it's fun and entertaining. So let's get into it. The log line is Adam and Margot's housewarming party is a success. One couple lingers after the other guests, revealing themselves to be wealthy neighbors. As one nightcap leads to another, Adam and Margot suspect their new friends are duplicitous strangers. Okay, so this stars Ryan Hansen as Adam, Melissa Tang as Margot, Timothy Granderos as Tom and Perry Matfield as Sasha. And that's there's other actors in it and there's there's other character situations, but none of them really are core to the center of the story. You've got the couple, Adam and Margot, who own this brand new home, and you have the couple, Tom and Sasha, or seeming couple, that stays after and just sort of refuses to go. <clears throat> so, excuse me, by way of explanation where I'm coming from as a viewer. Uh, I love home invasion films. I just love them. I think The Strangers is a fantastic film. And so anytime you get like a house party and it, or you just get, you know, a couple uh, in their home and there's a home invasion aspect to it, I'm sort of in. I don't know why. I, you know, it's just the idea of an invasion of, of intense privacy that I think is kind of terrifying uh, or exciting. And uh, this film really delivers that strongly. So the setup is where uh, Adam and Margo are moving into Hollywood Hills. They never thought they could ever afford a home up here, but they got this screaming deal. And what Adam tells Margo about this great deal is that in the distant past, someone died and in the home. And so that's why it was so inexpensive. The truth is very much different. And I just want to say this quickly, if you're tuning into this and you haven't seen this film yet, this is a Spoiler filled review. So I'm going to be telling the entire story. So I recommend you go watch the film, then come back. Now that that's said, um, the truth about the history of the home is that the parents were uh, like both murdered by each other. One slit the other's throat and one shot the other in the head. So the corpses were laying there, but there were twins of this couple that were still living in the house. And they just continued living there with their dead parents on the ground. And it like is slowly un unveiled where the twins started messing with the bodies, mutilating them and, and sort of, you know, defiling them a bit. So there's this horrible history and it's not till the neighbors or like a mailman or something or a gardener or something smells the rotting corpses that they, you know, find it. And this was 17 years before this film takes place in the home that Adam and Margot uh, bought. So Adam is uh, relatively successful in his business. I can't really remember if they talk about this specific business he's in, but the other people who work with him uh, that show up to the party and the other supposed friends see him as showing off and he is pretty douchey. I mean, they set up this character, uh, Adam, as just being a, a kind of a, just a douchebag. You know, he wants to look more important and more influential to his peers and he wants to kiss up to his boss. And, you know, he's, he's trying to be the best husband he can be while putting on airs. And, you know, he's trying to make the party use this hashtag Adam and Margot's crib, you know, as, as sort of like a social media thing. And it's it's very uncomfortable. It's very awkward. It's it's just straight up douchey. That's all he is. That's all I can say about him. Margot, it unravels that she is actually an ex-band member of this sort of underground band, this sort of indie band, but now they have their kid. And talk about lost opportunity 
uh, in this story because we open with their son uh, waking up from a nightmare, walking up to his parents' bedroom and blood oozing out of the bottom of the door. So we learn that their son has these recurring nightmares because, and it only started once they moved into the house. So it's almost like a Danny, the shining situation where he's tapping into this uh, dark side of the house's essence or something. Uh, so that was never fully developed. It was never fully explained because once we see that and we get this sense that, oh, there's something under the surface that's not quite right, he goes off for this party to have a, um, a sleepover with one of Margot's friends. Uh, and that's kind of the end of the story for him. You know, he comes back later on where he's not having any more nightmares and he had this nightmare at the sleepover when all this weird stuff was happening. But for all intents and purposes, they just drop that story beat, which is unfortunate because I think it's a good one. However, everything else that unfolds kept my attention and kept me engaged and wanting to know what happened next. So the party goes off, people start leaving throughout the end of the night, and we get to see Adam interact with different people in the party, and it sort of gets ridiculous. He notices when he's giving his uh, opening speech of the night, which again is pretty pretentious and douchey at a party, um, that there's this couple that he assumes were Margot's friends because they were just sort of standing there staring at him, but they look very strange, and this ends up being Tom and Sasha. And then uh, Margot thought it was Adam's friends. And so after everyone seemingly left, he was laying down <clears throat> with her on the couch and they were talking about the party, sort of in retrospect, and like, oh, and that couple, your friends, who the hell were they? And she's like, oh, I thought those were your friends. And then it turns out they're in the bathroom right now. And so they come out of the bathroom and they're like, whoa, you know, everyone freaks out that they're still there. And then they, you know, start to leave. But then he, uh, Tom... Um, compliments Adam and Adam being the douchebag he is sort of like ingratiates himself with the compliment and starts sort of kissing Tom's ass and then we see Margot start you know being the mm, not quite naggy wife but the the angry wife that's ready to go to bed and she doesn't like seeing her husband kiss up to people this way and so she's becoming increasingly more frustrated with their relationship in this sort of evening thing but the underlying surface of this is that they do genuinely love each other. And it's important to remember that because that is something that ends up saving them. And uh, that'll become more clear here in just a second. So um, ostensibly uh, they say, hey, let's have a nightcap. And they hang around, have drink after drink. And then the two groups, like the two girls and the two guys go off together. It turns out where Sasha had some uh, coke and uh, Margot ended up taking a line and getting high and, you know, having a cigarette, stuff that her, she hasn't done since she's had a kid. Uh, but she's doing it now because she wants to sort of cut loose because the kid is at a sleepover and this is their first time actually getting away. As a parent of two kids, I get that. I get you want to sort of unravel and have a good time when you actually have an opportunity to do so. Because as a parent, you don't. You're always, you know, with them and taking care of them and concerned about them and worried about them and thinking about them. And it's exhausting, <laughs> to be honest. Um, but it was nice to see that um, opportunity of escape for Margot and Tom and seeing Margot take advantage of it was just fantastic. So her and uh, this... Uh, Sasha are off and she uh, Margo pulls out her old guitar and she's playing a little bit of music and um, Margo's or I'm sorry Sasha's sort of pushing Margo to call her old bandmate which is an old boyfriend and get a reunion thing going and you're starting to see that Sasha and Tom are bad influences intentionally so they bring up ideas and thoughts that were not native to Adam and Margo but then they exploit them once they don't shut those arguments down immediately because, you know, drugs and drink and just being exhausted of the night and, you know, just trying to get along with other people. Um, and so she ends up calling the boyfriend. Uh, Adam, and Mar uh, Adam and Tom go off and Tom actually tells him that, you know, as a sort of a new neighbor thing, they sort of swap their swingers and they swap wives and husbands and he can have sex with uh, uh, Sasha if he wants, but he has to let Tom watch. And Adam doesn't explicitly say no. And he sort of says, oh, you know, that's a fun little idea. But again, he's not really 100% into it. He's just sort of going along with the moment and just as guys sometimes do fantasizing and stuff like that. Well, then Tom outs him for those thoughts 
And Sasha outs Margot for her calling her ex, and it becomes this big emotional thing. And ultimately, what Tom and Sasha are trying to do is mess with Adam and Margot and break them up. And you're trying to sit here and figure, like, why are they doing this? What, what is it that they're getting out of any of this? There's got to be something. And the more you start to unravel about the history of the past and the twins, the viewer immediately clicks in. Oh, okay, well, they're the they're the twins that, that survived. They're the murderers. Um, you know, they're here to, to relive past trauma. Um, and that's really all this is. But the Adam and Tom, I'm sorry, Adam and Margo don't really get that until the very, very, very end. And uh, when they straight up say, look, we're tired. We're tired of the games you guys are playing. You need to leave. They refuse. Tom and Mar um, Sasha just absolutely refuse saying, we're going to finish our drinks. And then, the, you know, uh, Adam's like, I'm going to give you to the count of 10, gets to three, takes a bottle, bashes it over Tom's head. Tom and Margo set themselves up. I'm sorry, Tom and Sasha set themselves up as if they were rich neighbors. But then when they continued to sort of press, when Adam and Margo started to press them on where they lived and stuff, they realized that they were lying the whole time. And so they claimed that they were at a house down the street further. And so when they finally leave after... Adam bashes him on the head with the bottle and then ultimately ends up apologizing over and over again when they, you know, lie and say they're at a different house that they live in. Um, they leave and they watch them walk to their supposed house. Uh, Tom seems to be having trouble with the door, but anyone who's watching is like, oh, he's clearly picking the lock of that home. And they just sort of invade this other home. And there's this really interesting moment that I really appreciated at the very end where Tom and Sasha are looking at each other saying, should we leave? And she says, yeah. And so you know that that was the moment that they decided not to kill Adam and Margot. You knew it was coming. It was led up to this point for a good 10 minutes or maybe even more, uh, depending on how quick you picked up on them being the murderer. But you knew that they were at a precipice. Should they kill them or should they not kill them? And they end up leaving. So when Adam is like leaving him, he's like, hey, I'm really sorry again. I hope you guys don't hate us. Um, Tom stops and turns around. He's like, oh, if we didn't like you, you'd know it. And you're like, yeah, of course, because you're alive. You are going to kill them. And then you realize they weren't such terrible people after all, because they made up in the back room after these two sort of riled them up and just tried to break up uh, Adam and Margo's relationship. But again, they love each other. So um, Tom and Sasha get into this other house because they're being watched. And then um, they realize that Sasha's earring was left behind. And so Adam goes to take Sasha her earring. And uh, Tom is like, you know, not letting him in. And then all of a sudden you hear this sort of like help in the background. And Adam immediately realizes that Tom and Sasha broke in and are holding the current couple in this household captive. And so he breaks in, except... Tom is much stronger or tougher or surprises him and then ends up capturing uh, Adam as well. So the whole time he's like, look, you guys were a good couple. We were going to let you live. Your insistence on coming here is what left you here. Now you're going to have to watch me do what I'm going to do. And he basically explains that they were fraternal twins when their parents killed each other and they just sort of stayed there and were messing with the bodies and it was obviously them. And they go back to that home from time to time and um, try to recreate what they experienced early on. Um, but apparently there was like some sort of abuse with the family and the neighbors supposedly knew about that abuse. And that's why he's gone to the neighbor's house and he's like torturing and going to kill them. And so he puts the pillow over the old woman's face and Sasha cuts the throat of the old man all in front of Adam and he's losing his mind. And then suddenly Margot comes over to the house because Adam hasn't come back very quickly. And uh, there's this moment where you're like, are they going to kill Margot? Please don't kill her. You know, don't do anything. Um, but then there's this other sort of B plot where the sleepover house for their son, the mom um, of that couple, the friend of Margot that's, you know, sort of hosting the sleepover for their son comes is trying to go to their house in order to get their son's toy because he said he can't sleep without it and he woke up on a nightmare and he sort of peed his pants and so it was this embarrassing situation but she said she would keep the sleep over and so she was just going to get the stuffed animal anyway um <clears throat> it turns out where uh um she is stopped in the street 
almost running into Tom and Sasha as they were leaving the house that they just murdered the couple in. And uh, he straight up threatened her and like stabbed her. And so she's like laying down uh, on the in the car, rolls out, grabs the rifle that's in the back, is set up where her husband's a rifle nut. And so uh, she grabs this rifle to try to kill him or something, but she's in incredible pain. She sees a figure coming down the street, which is actually tied up Adam coming out of the house, and she shoots it. Margot starts screaming and she runs forward. And you think that's the end. You're like, okay, well, this is a weird, twisted story. And that is where it really should have ended, in my opinion. But then we get this flash forward in the future where Adam is actually fine. The son has stopped having um, nightmares. And so they figure everything's good. Except while the old, the couple of Tom and Sasha were staying over and having that cocktail, uh, those cocktails, late at night, they had scratched one of Adam's records and he insisted that he'd get him an extra copy. Adam didn't believe him because it's like an out of print, uh, you know, old record or something or rare record. And suddenly he puts that record on or, or the record's playing and it doesn't skip. And so Adam is freaking out thinking, why isn't this skipping? That means that guy, Tom is in our house. And then he sees an old fashioned sitting there is just a, this statement saying, yeah, it's me. I gave you the record. I told you I would give you. And it lets him know that those people are still out there somewhere. And so it, it ends with this sense of terror and they could come back at any moment if we stop being good parents. They're actively watching us. And the only reason why we survived is because we're good parents and we're a good couple. So we need to keep that up. You know, it's one of those moralistic horror film stories. Um, and there's this whole other side plot of Margot really not wanting to move into this ostentatious, uh, pretentious home up in the hills. And then by the end, she's gone through fire. Now she feels like it is our house now. And so she's totally fine with it, even though this new terror, sense of terror at the very end is set out there that they're, you know, currently being watched and that, that Ad, um, Tom and Sasha have access to their homes still, which is also a terrifying notion because they're clearly insane uh, in some way. I mean, they're murderers. <laughs> uh, so, and that's really the end of it. I mean, it, it's a really fun home invasion with the twist of the ancient history of this home being the guests that no one invited who showed up at this party. And it feeds into Margot's insecurity about the home, her distrust of the home, their son's nightmares about the home. And then uh, going through all of the madness on the other side, the roles reverse where he wants to leave, but she wants to stay. And then they realize that they're being watched and stuff. So I really enjoyed the idea that this murderous couple have a moral side to their actions. So, and they're not a couple, they're brother and sister, uh, the tw fraternal twins. But Tom and Sasha don't want to murder uh, Adam and Mar Margot because they're good parents. They love each other. And so I just, I like that idea that they tested them throughout the night. They couldn't twist them with all their manipulations, their games. And so they left them alone. They're like, okay, good enough. You're okay. Now we're going to go pay back some of the people who knew that we were being abused by our own parents before our parents killed each other. And then, of course, throughout the course of the story, we learn that Tom and Sasha are the ones that drove their parents to murder each other by making each of them look like they were cheating on each other or they were, you know, acting in opposition to each other. And it just drove them into a frenzy of, um, you know, murder-suicide, basically. Or double murder, I guess is more accurate. Um, and so this Tom and Sasha couple are, are group pairing. They're great. I, I don't know that I ever really want to see them in a sequel of any sort, but I would watch it if they were. Uh, you know, there, it's a really kind of a wonderful dynamic when, when bad guys have their own moral system that they're operating within. And when that can be conveyed, albeit twisted, it's logical to some degree. And as a viewer, you can sort of appreciate that. Anyway, I really appreciate it. So uh, my favorite part of this film was probably just the idea of watching that manipulation go down where um, Tom is suggesting this menage a trois and then Tom is the one that uh, spills the beans to Margot that Adam wanted to be in a menage a trois with his supposed wife and seeing that sort of fracture. And Sasha was manipulating Margot about getting in touch with her old boyfriend and then watching that spill out when she, you know, it tells um, Adam about it. 
their their machinations in order to divide and break up this couple end up falling flat. And I just loved watching that work out because it goes to show that, you know, I've, I've experienced this in my own marriage where, um, you know, you get shit disturbers coming in from the outside trying to make shit, you know, trying to destroy what you have. And every relationship has flaws and every relationship has ebbs and flows and, and, and there's struggles and it, it's work. You know, a marriage is work. Any relationship takes effort. Um, but if you genuinely love each other, then you can work through any problems that are put in front of you. And I just like that idea because it's one that I live with my wife. You know, we've, we've been married for well over 20 years and we have a wonderful relationship. And yeah, at least I think so. <laughs> I hope she does. Um, and seeing the importance of that in this film, uh, because it's the direct result of their survival. Uh, I think it's great. I really appreciate that. My least favorite part was the drop storyline. They really could have exploited this idea of the son having some sort of um, psychological cue into what's going on. And they just sort of teased it and then they dropped it. And, you know, I understand you got to work for time and stuff like that. I don't know, maybe come back in a second film and examine it a little bit more or something. But I've always loved that idea that children and animals can pick up on things that adults and just regular people living their lives don't really necessarily pay attention to. They don't pay attention to these cues that, that exist in nature. However far you want to take that from <clears throat> an esoteric to an occult level, uh, I just like that idea of it. You know, it was presented beautifully with Danny in The Shining uh, by Stephen King and in Doctor Sleep especially. Um, but you know, it's, it's one of those ideas that I think is ripe for exploration and it's just, I don't think explored enough. And so I was a little bit disappointed that it didn't go a little bit further in here. Uh, ultimately my review of this film is, or my rating is going to be three out of five, uh, evil eyes. And that sounds bad, but I really mean it as, you know, it had some lost opportunities. It wasn't as high quality. I thought, uh, Ryan Hansen was a little too douchey. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he did his job too well, apparently, um, almost to the point where it was, it was, it was comical. And, and this is supposed to be a funny film and it is funny, uh, in some parts, but it's not slapsticky. It's not overt comedy. It's sort of subdued comedy. And, um, ultimately it, it was not as good as I believe it could have been not through editing as much as with possibly better casting, but more, a lost opportunity in storytelling. So that's where I leave it here. Thank you all so much for tuning in to this review of Who Invited Them by Duncan Birmingham. Uh, that is all I have for today. And like it or not, evil spelled backwards is live. So get out there and be evil. <laughs>